Okay, guys, we're going to get started. Uh, the last session of today. Uh, our next speaker is Anna Gilbert, um, who probably wins the prize for traveling the furthest distance of our speakers today, from all the way from University of Michigan. Uh, Anna is the Herman H. Goldstein Collegiate Professor of Mathematics at the University of Michigan. She actually did her PhD here at Princeton, and so, uh, actually all, virtually all of our speakers have some sort of a Princeton connection, although that wasn't necessarily planned. Um, she's a, uh, won tons of awards, Sloan Research Fellowship, NSF Career Award, National Academy of Sciences. Um, she's going to be telling us today about understanding the invertibility of convolutional neural networks. Uh, so I took an opportunity this afternoon to wander over to lovely Fine Hall, and uh, there's a bunch of pictures of grad students going back to sometime in the 60s, and uh, I took a photo of my class from 1993 on the wall just to show some of my grad students what I looked like when I was about 20. Um, <laughs> so you can you can wander over to Fine Hall and see see everybody on the wall there. Um, okay, so. Um, actually, there is also another Princeton connection uh, in this list of authors. Uh, Yi Zhang uh, was an undergrad at Michigan when he did this work with us, and he is now a grad student here in Princeton. Um, so you could have gotten somebody local. <laughs> um, so uh, this talk is um, uh, um, so this talk is sort of a, a mathematician's view of um, uh, convolutional neural nets. So a, a model for for deep neural nets, and um, you know we've had a whole bunch of talks, a whole bunch of wonderful talks today, uh, dis focusing, discussing the dynamics, the 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 um, solvability, the characteristics of um, uh, the optimization landscape and optimization dynamics in deep networks. And um, this work says, you know, do we really even need to look at all of that stuff? Could we come up with um, various sort of um, both mathematical models as well as um, you know breaking or retaining um, different nonlinear parts of convolutional neural nets? So Andrew's talk um, was was a, a really nice. There he is. Andrew's talk was a really nice setup. He said, you know, what if we uh, you know make this part linear and keep you know this mathematical problem nonlinear, sort of how much do we, do we get of the, of, the, of the behavior back? And so, you know, we uh, kept different parts of the nonlinearities in these networks, and we um, argued that there's a reasonable, a reasonable approximation to a reasonable reason why you can get rid of various other nonlinearities, and we did not focus at all on optimization methods, um, and um, instead, argued from data that an approximation is plausible. So we were interested in the invertibility of convolutional neural nets. And we sort of started with the observation that if you take a bunch of images and you reconstruct these images from deep features, that reconstruction is nearly perfect. That is, assuming you, know, you retain, oh, I can't really see. Okay, assuming that you retain the locations of the, um, or what my colleagues call switch locations. I never found this particularly informative, but the where values, you know, where did you retain the non-zeros when you did max pooling? In other words, if you unpooled uh, the max pooled values, the what, and you put them back into your great big long coefficient vector into their proper locations, um, that were transferred by the encoder, and then you reconstructed the images, you would get nearly perfect reconstruction. That's actually a series of you know, roughly three papers or so that demonstrated this. So we started with this observation, huh, CNNs, assuming you keep certain kinds of information, are essentially invertible. How is it that you can reconstruct, that you can reconstruct various images? Okay, so um, what we did in this paper was we started with this, with this observation, huh, looks, you know, these, these images look good. So why is that? So we provide theoretical analysis about the invertibility of CNNs. And um, we said, you know, if you squint at them and you ignore or you argue away various types of nonlinear maps, then the CNNs are analyzable with a form of uh, compressed sensing. And you're essentially doing sparse signal recovery in a certain model 
in a certain fashion. And if you do the appropriate theoretical analysis, you can actually get a reconstruction bound on how good a job these, these networks do. Um, and, whoops. And so the outline of my talk is going to be to discuss a little bit about CNNs and compressive sensing, um, to blur, you know, blast through the reconstruction error bound, and then you know, really to focus on, well, you know, do you have empirical evidence for A, any of those mathematical assumptions you made, and B, any of those mathematical results that you proved? So the answer is yes to both. You know, it's, all, it's always good to back up theory with examples. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so CNNs and compressive sensing. All right, so what are we going to do first? Uh, first, I'm going to tell you what components of the CNNs we're going to be focusing on, which ones um, we need to analyze, and which ones we're going to just we're going to argue away. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about compressive sensing and what form of the restricted isometry property we use. It's a model form, a model RIP, and then I'll um, give you the theoretical result, which is. Uh, basically, that if you turn the convolution matrix on its side, if you take its transpose, then that matrix satisfies a certain model RIP for a certain kind of model. And images are sparse. Images are well approximated by sparse linear combinations under, under these matrices. Okay, so what components of the CNNs are we going to be looking at? So, um, you know, we've got channels excuse me, for the various filters. <laughs> this is the input. And, um, you know, we convolve with a bunch of different filters. We pool the results into chunks. We set to zero a bunch of the values in each pool, just retaining the maximum in each pool. We then apply a nonlinear function, uh, the ReLU, and then that is our output. And now the first, the first thing that I'm going to say about how to get rid of this nonlinearity, this ReLU, you know, it's a big nuisance. And, and, and what is this thing doing? So ignore the pooling part and just think about the, the convolutional part. You're taking a matrix times a vector, right? So, you know, you're taking your filters. Okay, it's a convolution matrix. You're taking your filters times a vector, that produces a bunch of coefficients for you. And then you apply a ReLU function to a bunch of those coefficients. Ignore the pooling for right now. Okay, so what is ReLU doing? It's saying if any of those coefficients is zero, set them to zero and just retain the others. Okay, I'm ignoring any sort of offset. So basically it's retaining the non-negative coefficients only, right? Okay, so... That's kind, of, that's kind of a hard thing to analyze. You know, matrix vector multiplication with almost random like matrices, we know a lot about that. But none, none of this apply a non-negative you know, filter to it. So think for a second. Suppose I had plus W and I had a minus W. And I multiplied th that matrix stack together times my vector X. I would get positive products. I would get, I would get products of X with positive W and I would get products of X with negative W. And if I applied ReLU to both of those sets of coefficients, I would have the positive part of the vector W times X and I would have minus the negative part of the vector W times X. In other words, ReLU applied to plus and minus copies of W is purely splitting my vector into its positive components and its negative components. And if I could check to see that I actually had positive and negative filters that I learned in the CNN, then I could just get rid of this whole ReLU business because I could just keep my entire vector and not split it into positive and negative components. Okay, so, right, you know, that, that's simple math. You know, is that assumption a reasonable thing to do? So uh, this paper uh, by Shang et al., um, who was a student of, of Hung Lok Lee and myself, uh, went and looked at um, whether or not the learned CNN filters on ImageNet and AlexNet and VGGNet, whether or not it was a reasonable assumption, you know, are the, f are the filters, 
consistent with positive and negative pairs. And you know, up to, up to data analysis standards, they are, mostly, for most of the layers. And so for mathematical purposes, we don't need to b worry about this ReLU because all it is doing is on positive products and negative products is simply splitting, splitting W times X into its positive and negative components. So to analyze things mathematically, I don't need to worry about it at all. And I've already done away, actually this is the one main nonlinear thing that I have done away with. <laughs> And I have backed up my assumptions by going to look at data. Yeah, the data are pretty much consistent with this assumption. Good enough. Next. Okay, everybody buys this. This is an important thing to buy. Because if you buy this, then, then the rest of the talk is, is easy to sell. Okay, great. Oh, there we go. There, in case, in case you're, you're stumped, what the hell is she saying? There we go. F of, F of X can be de decomposed into its positive part and its negative part. Done. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, the pooling part, right? I we did. I've done away with the with the ReLU term, and I'm just left with convolution and pooling. Okay. I'm going to keep pooling because I actually like this idea, and it's not actually not such a horrible nonlinearity to deal with, as long as I retain the positions of here. I got to walk to the screen. What, it's what the deep learning people call the switch unit. Okay. All right, so that's my encoder. And the decoder network says, uh, wait, I need the next picture. The decoder network says unpool, i.e. take this big square, put in the value that you retain, where it should be, and fill in the rest with zero. Okay, so that's unpool. And then, uh, well, that's not really what they mean, but uh, <laughs> peak involve, you know, mul multiply by the transpose of the, of the convolution matrix. Um, and then here, you know, we have to keep the switch information, the side information that we keep in our encoder, decoder, but you know, that's okay. Ah, here's a diagram showing retain it's very hard to keep me tied to a podium. <laughs> so here's a, here's a picture of um, what it means to retain the switch units and fill in the positions um, that you didn't keep with zeros. Okay, so that's a picture. Okay, great. Okay, so here are the components of the encoder. Um, I do convolution and I do pooling, retaining the switch units. And when I um, do my decoder, I unpool using the side information, and then I do my deconvolution. And I check to see is the reconstruction, does it look like the input vector or input image? Okay, and notice there's no ReLU in here. I have argued away that nonlinearity. And I have argued it away by doing a bunch of data analysis and uh, you know, observing mathematically what that data analysis does for us. Okay, so how do we get a reconstruction error bound? How do we say, how can we analyze how close the input is to the output given an architecture like this? All right, so we're going to use uh, this machinery called compressed sensing, and this is, the idea that we can acquire a signal by obtaining linear measurements of, um, of that signal under a short, fat, sort of randomish matrix phi. And we can reconstruct that signal by solving an underdetermined system subject to some sparsity constraints. And how we go about reconstructing that signal, there are a bunch of different algorithms for doing this. And you'll see, I want you to think about one particular algorithm because it, it, it is the architecture of the uh, deep neural net. Okay, so I said that phi, this short fat matrix, should be um, short and fat, and it should be somewhat random-ish, okay? So in fact, um, 
it's got a, it doesn't have to, but it's, it's nice. Um, it's sufficient if it satisfies the restricted isometry property. Um, these are the kinds of bounds that it's fairly, it's easy for me to show uh, that the kind of matrices that come up in these CNNs satisfy these, these properties. So I'm gonna tell you what it is. It says that if I have a, a vector Z with K non-zero entries, then there's some constant such that the L2 norm of phi times Z is almost the L2 norm of the original vector, up to some distortion one plus or minus delta. Okay, so it says that phi is a near isometry on k-sparse vectors, and it's completely parameterized. Oh, there we go, nearly orthogonal on sparse signals. Okay, and how do you generate, what are some ways that one can generate matrices that satisfy the RIP? One way to do it is to generate Gaussian random matrices. So with high probability, they'll satisfy RIP. Okay, so we would like to argue that our deconvolution process, we would like to argue that this part of our architecture, that this procedure here satisfies a certain kind of RIP. Okay, we would also like to argue that this part of our process is a fairly reasonable approximation for, um, for images. Okay. Oops. Okay, so in order to check that that part of our architecture satisfies a certain kind of, of RIP, we need to look to see that the output of CNNs is sparse and we need to check, I mean, this is pretty easy, we need to check that this deconvolution procedure is multiplicative. Okay, and then finally, okay, those first two things, that's math. <laughs> the last thing, we actually have to back up with some data analysis. And this is where we argue whether or not it is reasonable to ignore all of the machinery that went into training and learning the weights for these CNNs. Okay, so is it reasonable to assume that the filters in our CNN are Gan Gaussian random filters? Is that a reasonable thing? So this is actually the, this is the stickiest part <laughs> of this paper. We had a huge problem trying to argue that yeah, this is actually not too bad. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a bunch of a bunch of data that we collected on the trained filters that came out of VGGNet and AlexNet and all the different layers to say, you know, this is actually not, not so terrible. Um, um, an assumption, and I'm gonna say, you know, yeah, I fully agree that Gaussian random filters are not the optimal thing to do. They don't give you the best, you know, the best learning rates. Um, they're not nearly as good as something that's been highly engineered and trained for weeks. But hey, you know, <laughs> I can't analyze that. <laughs> I can't analyze that system with all those, with all those sophisticatedly trained weights. And um, I loved whose, maybe it was Joan's list of papers that had studied the dynamics of optimization in the, just the last year. They filled a page Maybe it was Andrew. They filled a page and he said, oh, there are many, many more. Said, yeah, well, you know, nobody else can analyze it either. <laughs> Lots of people are trying. How about we just ignore that for right now and just do some math, right? I don't know, it's fairly, it's actually a reasonable assumption. Okay. All right, so is the output of the CNN sparse? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So what is pooling doing for me? It's saying, you know, look, in these different chunks, of my image, I'm going to set to zero all but the largest entry, okay? And so I end up with, a, with a, a matrix, an image, where a huge number of entries have been set to zero, and just a few of them are, are non-zero, just a few of them have been retained. And so yes, if you know, think of that as one giant long vector, then yes, that is certainly a sparse vector. Just a small number of entries are non-zero. How many of them are there? Well, as many entries, as many 
blocks that you have when you do this max pooling, that's how many non-zero entries you have. So the zero padding is giving you sparsity. Um, you know, if you were to put in the ReLU, the ReLU also forces a bunch of things to zero. The other thing to notice in this block structure stuff is that the signal, it's sparse, yes, but it's also structured in some sense in that the non-zeros come in chunks. You have one per chunk. Okay, you can't have all K of them in one chunk. That would violate the max pooling procedure. So there's one, at most, one non-zero per chunk, and maybe, you know, at most K chunks, however many filters you have. Okay, so it's a sparse signal, but it's structured in a certain way. Okay, so that suggests that instead of using this uh, generic machinery of, uh, of the RIP, we should instead use something called the model RIP and build in the structure of the sparsity. And model RIP just says, you know, look, if you have a model for the structured sparsity in your vector, then um, your matrix satisfies RIP if it's a near isometry on those model sparse signals. Okay, that, great. That means that um, instead of looking at any k-sparse vector and looking z and looking at phi times z, I should look at only those vectors z that satisfy this certain model sparsity. And then phi times z should be a near, should be almost uh, the original L2 norm. Oh, here we go. I don't have to wave my hands. There's animation. I have k blocks, k non-zero entries, at most one per block. Does everybody get this picture? Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, this example is here in the, in the slides. Um, and um, 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 it's partly to highlight the difference between how mathematicians think and how, um, how non-mathematicians think. <laughs> because, you know, it takes me about two seconds to, less than two seconds to, of course convolution is linear. You know, it's a linear operator, of course. If it's a linear operator, of course I can represent it as a matrix times a vector. Okay, done. Uh, if you would like an animation of this, watch the following. Oops, was that too fast? Boop, okay, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I teach linear algebra, and I really wave my hands around, and I draw pictures. Um, it's helpful to have animation. Okay, so equivalently, if you think about convolution as a, right, it's a linear operator, okay? That means I can write it as a matrix times a vector, linear algebra. What does that matrix look like? It looks like this. Okay, that's what my matrices look like. And my images, my images look like this. Images are vectors to me. And then here is the output. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a little bit more, you know, actual like realistic bookkeeping I need to do, and that is that we actually have multiple input and output channels. So, you know, my cartoon of uh, you know just one convolution matrix times a vector was not really accurate. I have a whole bunch of different filters for a whole bunch of different channels. I guess there's, well, there's certainly three colors, but uh, you know, I have different input and output channels. So different matrices, different vectors, different filters. Okay. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a simple 1D example because uh, it's easy to do linear algebra. For 1D things, it's easy to draw cartoons, but you could extend this to 2D. Okay, so here's the sticky point. Are Gaussian random filters reasonable? Is that a reasonable assumption to make? I mean, it's, you know, it's certainly not, the state will not give you the state of the art CNN, but is it reasonable? You know, they're actually, they're not too bad. They are effective. Let's put it that way. Effective in both supervised, supervised and unsupervised tasks. And look, there's a whole series of references, and you know they're surprisingly effective. They're good enough for us to start doing mathematics. Let's put it that way. 
Okay, so let's summarize what it is we've done. We've argued, yes, the output of CNNs is sparse. Yes, convolution is linear and linear algebra is great. And we've argued that yes, in practice, assuming we have Gaussian random filters is, is a reasonable mathematical assumption to make. Let's go to work. Okay, so then the next thing we have to argue is that if you take a CNN and you use random Gaussian filters as opposed to the learned filters, then if you look at the convolution operator in a transposed setting, so let's take the convolution matrix and transpose it, then it satisfies the model RIP with high probability. And um, you know this, this corollary, this argument is nothing other than um, an application of matrix, con matrix concentration results. Um, you have to be a little careful in that it's not, it's not a, it's it's not a super brain dead argument following Roman's result because if you have short filters, then and they don't overlap much in your columns, then you don't get quite as much concentration. You don't have quite as many random variables to add up, and so. Um, Having short filters actually hurts you in getting things to concentrate. And um, having multiple input channels helps you get all these random variables to sum up and to concentrate. Okay, so, um, right, it says corollary. I don't give you a precise statement and I don't give you a precise proof. I see some of you waving your hands around, ah, oh, the columns, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> And if I look across the rows, how many, in how many places do all these columns overlap? I add all those guys up, those are a bunch of Gaussian random variables. How do they concentrate? Okay, so you have a sketch in your head. Excellent. All right, so let's go look at this reconstruction error bound. All right, so the next thing that you have to do is, um, sort of go dig up uh, uh, one of these signal recovery algorithms that's known as iterative hard thresholding, that's this IHT. And then you have to think like a mathematician, what is the CNN doing like in terms of linear algebra? Like in terms of linear algebra and pseudocode, not, not boxes and pictures. But, but what is it doing? And if you put the two of them next to one another, you'll say, ah, so going from one layer to the next in my CNN to reconstruct from, from my hidden units is exactly one iteration of iterative hard thresholding with, with the filters that happen to be at, at that particular layer. And so, ah, you know, maybe, maybe there really is something to this connection between sparse signal recovery and, and CNNs. So, I will um, breeze through the components of CNN and the decoder, and um, you know, also breeze through the theoretical result. Maybe we'll get to some pictures. Yeah. Ah, iterative hard thresholding. Okay, so what does it do? It multiplies um, your measurements by the transpose of your short fat random matrix so that you get a great big long proxy vector. And then it says, you know, look, let me just retain the top k values in this great big long coefficient vector and set everything else to zero. That's it. And you know, it it subtracts that off from the current approximation. It you know remeasures, so it, it iterates. But I'm just giving you the multiply by the transpose of a matrix and set to zero a bunch of coefficients. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Excellent. Okay, you pass. <laughs> okay, so, ah, uh, yes, iterative hard threshold. What is iterative hard thresholding? We just had this conversation <laughs> with the student who passes, and uh, it's an algorithm uh, designed by Blumenstath and Davies in 2009. Oh, and here it is, I'm sorry, I forgot what was coming next. So this is exactly what I said, uh, something like that. Multiply by the transpose, 
and then threshold set to zero, all but the top k entries in B, and then iterate. Yeah, that, that pseudocode is what I said. Um, now, um, this is actually a little fancier than what I said because there's model-based iterative hard thresholding there, and there's this M. It's not at all apparent that M is thresholding. What model-based iterative hard thresholding says, you know, it says take, take the transpose of your short fat matrix, multiply by your measurements, and then give me the best K term representation to B, or best K term approximation to B in this model setting. Okay, so when it's just plain iterative hard thresholding, you just take the top K largest entries in B, you threshold, and you go about your merry way. Um, when we have this model st sparsity structure, remember we can only keep one non-zero entry per chunk. Okay, and as we just discussed, that is exactly the pooling operation. Keep the largest entry per chunk and set everything else to zero. So this model of sparsity that is induced by pooling and this pooling, you know, this max pooling operation is exactly that step. And the, you know, convolved, deconvolved is exactly multiplied by phi, transpose multiplied by phi, depending on I got my dimensions right. And there we go. Convolution plus pooling can be seen as one iteration of iterative hard thresholding. And there's the important parts. All right. The, what's in the slides is exactly what I said. Okay. All right. Also just what I said. Um. Somebody's recording these, somebody has my slides, so um, I can wave my hands and say that was exactly what I just said. <laughs> okay, all right, so how do we prove a reconstruction error bound? What does model RIP have to do with anything? Um, so there's no statement of the theorem or sketch of a proof, so let me discuss this for you. So. Um, in the analysis of uh, model-based iterative hard thresholding, there's a theorem that says if, if your matrix satisfies model RIP with certain parameter delta, then iterating iterative hard thresholding every time gives you a decay in the error between your output solution or your intermediate solution, if you will, and the true solution in L2 error, it's upper bounded by some number that depends on your sparsity parameters, your RIP parameters, times the L2 norm of the original signal. To say this in a slightly different way, the proof for model iterative hard thresholding says at every iteration, the error decreases by some fraction of the original norm of the signal. So after so many iterations, your error is, you know, a tiny fraction of the original L2 norm of the signal. Okay? And so what we show in our analysis is that if you just run one step of iterative hard thresholding for this particular model, Assuming that your matrix satisfies model RIP for this particular model, then after one step, the error that you've made looks like this. Okay, and you know, our analysis says nothing about exactly how big these parameters are. So this is the model RIP sparsity parameter for k non-zero coefficients, and this is the one for 2k non-zero coefficients. So the analysis of the theorem doesn't need to know anything about these particular values other than that they're less than one and bigger than zero. Calculating them exactly for any given matrix is hard. And instead, what we did was we argued two things. We argued, or you know, we calculated with high probability 
what the model RIP parameters would be for Gaussian random filters of a certain length and a certain overlap for various number of channels. And then we actually went and calculated um, a proxy for these parameters on real data. And we actually went and reconstructed via our simplified algorithm, we, we reconstructed images with this really, really simple algorithm in order to assess empirically this bound on, on learned filters to see, ah, you know, in a simplified setting, is our math still consistent with, with empirical analysis? Okay. And, okay, so this outline is what I just said. <laughs> okay. And we did a bunch of experiments, first in 1D and in 2D, just to check that um, math and empirical data were consistent in a simplified algorithmic setting. So in a, if you will, and this is a nice phrase, in a synthesized environment. Okay, so that's the picture. And sure enough, uh, do our filters, if they're Gaussian random filters, and we do this max pooling business, do these satisfy RIP, model RIP, you know, with reasonable probability? Yep, sure enough, you know, this distortion factor is sandwiched between one minus something and one plus something. So that's great, you know, uh, synthetic data verifies theory. Okay. <laughs> now, is this reconstruction error reasonable? So again, we take our synthesized environment and sure enough, we plotted, we plotted this ratio so as to validate this constant and sure enough, it's fairly small. In other words, uh, this error is a small fraction of the original energy. So X hat must have pulled off a decent amount of energy from the original signal in just one iteration. And we did this for in 2D and we did this on VGGNet just to see the distribution of the model RAP condition in a real setting with real filters. And we plotted it and, you know, it's not perfect. Wow, it's pretty good though. It's pretty consistent with uh, pretty consistent with mathematical models. So you know, math is not not too it's not it's not too bad a model. Okay. And then we uh, did uh, we tried a re uh, reconstruction algorithm that looks an awful lot like um, like iterative hard thresholding. We did a little regularization instead. Um, uh, yeah, a little regularization instead. Um, and then, you know, we've made it really explicit. Look, you've got to keep the switch units when you do the pooling. So this pseudocode looks an awful lot more like what you ha actually have to do for real images, you know, retaining all these switch units, making that very explicit. Okay, and when you do that uh, and reconstruct on VGGNet, and uh, I need I need the next. When you do that, then um, uh, then you actually get fairly decent uh, reconstructions. So um, here are the original images, and they're gonna go in. Here are the um, here are the reconstructions that we get using this pipeline for uh, compute the sparse approximation and then recover, uh, recover the original image from the sparse approximation. And um, I believe that these are just using um, layer five, the filters from layer five uh, from, these are learned filters from layer five of, uh, of VGGNet. Okay. Um, actually, I can't tell what's on the slide versus what's on the computer. Okay, one of them must be random filters. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. 
Ah, here we go. Here's the random filters. No, it's not bad, actually. I mean, it's not perfect, and it's certainly not state of the art, but, um, you know, pretty good. Okay. Um, so, we also did a couple of interesting, um, interesting tests, um, you know, primarily because my co-authors are not mathematicians. Um, <laughs> They 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 wanted to they they wanted to actually test things, um, <laughs> um, and so uh, they did some interesting experiments to see um, how critical how critical was this switch information versus um, the actual values um, that that got put into here. So what is the ro what is the role of sort of forgetting these switch values? And so um, that's not something that we can address. Um, particularly well mathematically, but they had some really fantastic, intriguing results. Um, and um, let's see, what is the next? Ah, okay, so what they, what they determined was um, the content information in these images is preserved in the hidden activation. That means the actual values that are retained and the spatial detail in the images is preserved in noting or retaining where these values have occurred when you did the pooling system. And so you need both, I guess. Or, or this, is this experiment, uh, these experiments highlight the role of um, the values themselves versus um, where they occur. Not something we can analyze mathematically, but it's intriguing. Okay. Um. Yeah. So we we um, we didn't go analyze that sort of stuff. Um, we did go and um, verify. Yeah. You know that model is not too bad. Uh, a linear sparse approximation model for images. I mean, that's been a result that's been known or conjectured for, or posited, I think is the right, posited is the right verb, for a number of years that, you know, it's not, it's not too bad, a model for images. It's not, you know, it's not definitive, but it, it's not too bad. And we actually went and verified that some, but that's not, that doesn't address, ah, which part of these models, you know, keeps the sky, which part keeps the location of the sky, which part keeps the feathers, et cetera. We didn't, we didn't collect that kind of information. Okay. Um, move that up, right? Okay. Okay, so let me just, let me just summarize since uh, I'm at the end. And that is that uh, we've got, um, you know, a reasonable mathematical model for, uh, for CNNs, um, ignoring, if you will, <laughs> all of the training and learning dynamics and optimization, and, uh, you know, eh, maybe it's not so bad. Um, and we can get a reasonable mathematical argument for why CNNs do such a nice job in, uh, in reconstructing images. Um, and we've also sort of isolated um, what, what parts of the information contained in CNNs are responsible for what parts or what features, if you will, of the reconstructions you get in images. And then um, finally, I know that some folks here have studied um, using, uh, you know, um, more sophisticated nonlinear functions than just ReLU, so things that give you um, purely signed bits, so plus and minus ones, or some nice uh, sigmoidal type functions that, or hyperbolic tangents that force your hidden units not to specific, you know, non, not, not to uh, non-negative real, non real values, but actually to, to plus and minus ones. And it's kind of neat. There is a theory of compressed sensing that will handle one bit measurements, so measurements that are either plus one or minus one, where you just take the sign of your matrix vector product, the signum of, your, of each entry of the matrix vector product. And then it's fascinating 
one of the reconstruction algorithms for which you can prove anything for one bit compressed sensing is exactly one iteration of iterative hard thresholding. It also has a closed form solution which consists of simply soft thresholding. So um, I, th I think there's lots of, lots of room for, um, lots more room still for analogies between sparse signal recovery and, uh, and CNNs. Okay, great, thank you. Do we have some time for questions? Uh, thank you. Very, very interesting. I'm wondering if you thought at all about how this might apply to a supervised setting. It, it seems like in this case ah. you're you're making this sparse measurement of the 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 input, and then you sort of reconstruct. But you could also view it as that your input image is actually a dense measurement from. Uh, a very sparse object identity vector that then paints into an image. And so the whole CNN in the supervised setting would be inverting one of these um, essentially press sensing measurements. So yeah, so um, we have not thought about this in the supervised setting. Um, I can tell you that we have thought about one bit compressed sensing for feature selection in a supervised setting. Um, in fact, actually, that, that's, that's one of the original applications that you know, I, I've started to think about. So no to part of your question, yes to an unanswered part of your question, an unasked part of your question. <laughs> uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, in the images you showed for reconstruction, it seemed that the reconstruction was at least visually better for the trained filters rather than the random filters. Whereas in theory, the like the, the theoretical analysis really holds much better for the trained filters. Is that is that due to the metric that there's a d mismatch between the L2 metric and our like psychovisual metric, or is that something that you observe? Um, so there are uh, there are many ways to answer this question. One is that the L2 metric is of course not the eyeball metric. Um, and you know you can get you can get images that have horrible L2 norm that look perfect, um, and 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 conversely, um, yeah I don't know I don't I don't have a, I don't have an explanation for 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 why they should look better, one way or another I you know that I can't quantify that, um, you know I can say that the learned filters have been seriously optimized to minimize some some error not of course the eyeball. The eyeball metric, but you know, I have a feeling that they're probably better than Gaussian random ones. But those, you know, those are not too bad. So I was interpreting the bound that you had correctly there, where every every iteration of I, of IHT you're reducing the error by a multiplicative factor of the norm. That was the multiplicative factor of the norm of the true vector or the, the true sparse vector or the estimate? Uh, the true the true sparse vector. So, okay, awesome. So um, in a lot of uh, compressed sensing theory- or, or the true input, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> yes, yes, sorry. So, uh, so in a lot of the compressed sensing theory, there's kind of two parts of these bounds where there's the you know, the true sparse signal, and then there's the, like the model mismatch, right? The deviation, yeah. so maybe something like the- X minus XK. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> so uh, is, can that come up in, in different versions of your, your theory? Is there a way to quantify if, you know, you had compressible but not sparse si signals or- Ah, okay, so there are, a couple, there are a couple parts to the answer to the question. One is no, X minus XK does not come up in, um, Okay, so the model mismatch or the norm of the tail analysis does come up in the analysis of iterative hard thresholding. It's when you put this model business in there and you put in and you allow what I call noise, what you call model mismatch, that analysis gets very hard. And so, you know, yes, for plain iterative hard thresholding, you can do that. It's much harder to do that for model iterative hard thresholding to put in that, that noise factor. And so um, you'll notice we didn't. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just much, much harder. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I had a quick question. Uh, so you said you did this analysis using activations in layer five of VGGNet, is that right? 
Yeah, this this particular picture. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering if you if you looked at other layers of the network and asked sort of yes. which ways the reconstruction was altered or not. Yes. So in fact, actually, I I think in the orig I think in the in the full paper there's a whole there's a whole slew of pictures. There's like page after page of pictures that say, look, this is what happens when you do different layers. And so actually, there's there's a difference between the deepest layer and the and the and the the, sh the shallowest layer, and so yes, it really does make make a difference. And um, you know, I just showed layer five here because that that's fairly deep and it, it looks good. Um, and there are probably somewhere statistics of this sort of uh, statistics of this empirical RIP bound for different layers, and you can actually see you know the mathematical assumptions degrade at at different layers, and so you know. Yes, all that analysis is in the paper, and yes, it really does matter what layer you're talking about um, in terms of uh, appropriateness of the mathematical assumptions. Any others? All right, let's thank Anna one more time. All right. Okay. Great.